In this video, I'll quickly go through some of the new features and add-ons to Bitwig Studio version 2.2, uh, mostly just so if you're tracking the progress of this program, you can go through a lot of my videos and kind of see from stage to stage to stage what's being added so that you can make your decision about if and when you're going to invest in the program. If you're already a power user, to be honest, I don't think you're going to get that much out of this video. I'll talk about some of the new features and where I might use them, but most of you probably already have better ideas than I do. So really, this is just more of a resource. <laughs> Um, Bitwig Studio 2.0 was released, I believe, the last week of February, first week of March, somewhere around there. And then we got an update to 2.1 in May. I think it was around May 20th. And then we got our update here to version 2.2, second week of October. So if you upgraded right away, you maybe can expect to get one more major point update before you would need to pay again with like a version 2.3. Don't quote me on that. Maybe they'll start rolling out features a lot quicker, but just judging from the track record, that seems to be the pace at which they're going. It's not a whole lot different to how things really were with version one. So I'm not sure how anything's really changed too much, um, but hopefully we'll get some more cool features if you upgrade it right away um, and you'll get some more things to play with in the near future. So let's just go through this. I have a list. It's not an exhaustive list and it's very much personal to me what I think is important. And so for you, some things may be uh, much more important than others, but we'll try to talk about them as evenly and as uh, fairly as we can. All right, let's do it. So the first thing that I noticed on the change log, which really caught my attention, was that they wrote improvements to the audio and note engine. Now, when I upgraded to version 2.0, I'm on a Mac as well, um, I start to have a lot of problems with version 1, you know, there wasn't that much in there and the program ran great. It basically never crashed on me, absolutely loved it. I know other people had some issues with it, but with version two, I started getting the crash bug, especially when you have a really complicated program or a really um, full featured song. I don't know how to explain it, a dense song, a hundred tracks, something like that. The program just really couldn't handle it and it would be crashing all the time. And for a program, whose strength really is in workflow and encouraging you to get in there and do stuff, having crashes like that is really unacceptable regardless of the size of the project that you're working on. So I don't know if that's been fixed or addressed, but the fact that they wrote that so high on the change log, I'll let you know next time I go in here and really do something um, full featured and really try to push the program, we'll see if it's able to hold up to that. Um, but I'm optimistic. And hopefully some of those issues that I've had before have been resolved. So that was kind of the biggest one for me. It's just a small little line on the change log. But if those things have been addressed and, and some of those bugs have been fixed, then I'm going to be a very happy camper. The real big marquee add-on with version 2.2 definitely would be the time shift device. And you can argue this should have been in here from version 2.0. I think that that's a fair argument. Pretty much every other DAW has some kind of a track delay. And this is Bitwig's answer to that. So it's not working the way like the Ableton Live one would work, where on every single track at the end of the chain, you have the option to bring up track delay and either shift things forward or back. This is a device like any other device, but it's not something you're going to modulate. And it is something that impacts the overall audio engine. So when you move things, you're going to hear a click because everything kind of has to reset from a back end perspective. Now, why is something this small and seemingly insignificant so very? very, very important and so very complicated to execute. Well, really, this has to do with hardware for the most part. Um, Bitwig Studio and what I at least think they're trying to go for, the niche community they're really trying to get are people working on touch screens, that sort of touch interface, and also people with modular setups who want to be able to control that from like a software hub, from a DAW hub, that DAW being Bitwig Studio. Well, anybody who's worked with any kind of hardware knows there's always some degree of latency. There's always some degree of lag. And even if you're just recording also, if you've done a lot of recording in the past, you know there's always some degree of latency latency and lag, we're having a track delay becomes very important, almost crucial, almost required if you want to get things all working in time when you're playing them back. My work around to this point when I've been working with synthesizers that haven't been in time would be to kind of make the part bounce it and then I'd have to manually shift it into place. That works well and good if you're just going with like a couple of instruments, but when you have a really, really big studio with a lot of hardware and you want everything to play nicely together, 
a time shift is is absolutely required. So if you upgraded in February or March, you've got this. So, you know, no harm, no foul. Um, but I think for them, this was the number one concern, the number one priority, because a lot of people who have those modular setups, and clearly you have a lot of money if you have like a really complex modular synthesizer, so you can afford Bitwig Studio, they weren't going to update until they knew that they had something like a time shift in order to put things where they need to be. So my guess is this is what they've been working on for the longest amount of time. Um, so far, are so good in terms of me testing it out it even goes down to like sample accuracy which is crazy uh, i don't know if it really needs to be that in depth but i'm happy it's there and hopefully for all of you working with hardware this is going to ease some of your pains just remember this is a utility device if you're not working with any hardware no reason for you to bring the time shift in unless you are doing a mixing session and let's say you're trying to sync up microphones or something like that like something's been recorded in stereo and it's out of phase you could bring the time shift in on one of those and try to line it up but in that case personally i think it's actually easier to just manually go in there and um, pull things over and, and kind of set it that way uh, either way great to have the time shift um, this was something that the program actually needed this wasn't like a want on the list this was a need it has been addressed hopefully it works and now they can get back to doing uh, more creative things also, with version 2.2, some improvements have been made to some of the existing modulators. Um, for me personally, the updates to the steps modulator is absolutely huge. This was the thing I was complaining about from the beginning, um, that the step mod was actually more powerful than the new steps modulator. And ideally, if it was up to me as a user, I don't want to be having to use the uh, legacy devices. I would hope that everything in the new program is, is better or as good as what's come before. So with the steps now, um, some things have been fixed with the looping. And also, we are back to getting the smoothing control. So we didn't have that before. And now we do, which is huge. So if we go in here and we just um, put this on to the filter, for example... Here, it's all jumping around. We can smooth that out. Which is definitely something that I was interested in and really wanted. Also, you'll find in the ADSR and also the ADHSR, if you're not working with this in polyphonic mode, you can set this up to work as a single trigger, which is something I really wanted too. So if we go in here and let's set this up and let's just put this onto something like oscillator sync, just so we'll be kind of extreme. <laughs> You can tell when I let go of a key, it will single trigger. But if I keep playing, it doesn't restart that. So very, very useful. Um, something I'm really, really happy to see here. So that's a, these are kind of small things, but ultimately they're pretty big things if, if that's something you expect or something that you want to be able to use. And these are your go-to modulators, right? So nice to see some improvements um, being added there. Another very small update, but could be a big update for some people, is inside of the note latch, we now have the ability to have it stop triggering a note when the sequencer stops. So if I'm clicking play here and I hit a note, right, this is just going to play on for infinity. And in the past, you'd have to go in here and actually click and tell this thing to stop. Well, now... If I stop the playback, if I stop the transport control, it will stop on its own. So very happy that that's been added in there for those of you who might just like get a droning tone going in the background and you're in there and you're messing around like with a drum beat, for example, like you have, um, and, and this is not uncommon, right? You have like a chord just playing and you're hearing that you're getting a sense of it and you want to just then go in and maybe make some adjustments to drums or something else with that in the background. The great thing is you can now stop this and by just stopping the, the transport by hitting the space key, it's going to stop that note from playing as well. Something small, but significant. Moving right along, Bitwig Studio has added a decent amount to their sound content collection, including 
what they call like rare vintage organs and keyboards. I don't really know how rare or vintage they are. But the thing I do like about this is that the program desperately needed some more multi samples. Um, the sampler is still not very strong, but you can see that they've added in quite a bit of stuff here. And in addition to the multi samples, um, we now do have uh, grand piano. And in addition to this, they've added just some presets to the sampler too. So they've brought some of these things in, they've layered them up, they've combined them. Definitely go and check those out on your own. Very excited to see that. Always love having more options. And these things in their raw state, for example, let's just bring in the viola here. You're going to hear that it's a very... raw sound and so it's prime uh it's a prime candidate for uh, affecting further and that's something bitwig encourages you to do and i think that they've done a good job of not making these overly complicated very clean sounding samples that you can actually work with and manipulate and warp um any way that you see fit they've added some additional samples as well including um, a pretty meticulously sampled 606 you can see we now have a lot of different folders here as compared to even like the 808 or the 909 there's a lot going on in here gone through valve saturation or maybe through some kind of uh warmth i don't know what that would be because i would think valve would be tube so valve saturation maybe that's tape i don't know valve warmth tube who knows doesn't matter but the point is you have a lot more sounds to choose from and for somebody like me or even somebody who just doesn't have a lot of money and you're going to be picking up a program you want to make music right away you need to have a good sound collection to do that. I get that maybe that's not who they're trying to uh, market this product for, but I still think it's important um, for people at the very beginning of their music creating journey to not have to go online and try to find additional samples or get bogged down in um, having millions of samples on their hard drive. I'm always happy when I see things being added to the sound content collection, and I hope that continues because honestly, for me at this point, with the way a lot of the other updates have been going, these are the things that almost get me the most excited about the program. All right, cool. Let's move on. All right, moving right along, we have a couple of new modulators. And to me, it's kind of like if you're not all in on the modulator system already, um, this isn't going to make you any more excited to want to run out and pick up the program. But if you do really like the modulation system and you're especially interested in messing with the modulation source, the shape of that source, then you're going to really like what's been added here to version 2.2. And we'll begin with probably my favorites. And I thought this would be the most confusing, the polynome. But actually, I really like this one. It allows you to adjust the scaling of like a typical knob move. So let's say you have a macro that's mapped to like a bajillion different things, the polynome could actually be added on after the fact to further shape the way that you would turn that knob. So the best way to describe this is just to kind of go in here and mess around with it. I'm just going to set this on to amplitude so you can see right now with things set as they are, it's just going to move like normal. Okay. And you can see that it's moving in the amplitude like normal. Nothing fancy, nothing special about that. But with these different values down here, you can actually offset things and start to change the shape and the curve. And you can then go a step further and even modulate these guys for more variation. And I'll do that in a second. But let's start by taking this here. And you can see that we could make this much steeper so that if I was at two, if I just go a little bit, it's going to shoot up to the top of the amplitude very quickly or vice versa. Oops, moving the wrong thing. Right, and it kind of holds. You can see what gets to the top then and it's not going to move any further. Uh, let's bring that back down. We could go the other direction with it, or we can start to add some curves to things. So let's bring this to zero. And you can see it's just a straight line. And now with these two, I can either add like a smiley face, I could go frowny face here. Let's go smiley face. So you'll see that if I go to the left, it's also going to continue to rise up here. Sorry about the fact that those tooltips are kind of getting in the way, but I think you get the basic idea here. We could go the other direction. Let's put that at zero. And then the last one creates more of like an S-like curve. Okay, so you can combine those just to give yourself some more variation and intrigue in the way you're modulating sources. All right, that's really the key to this. It's all about additional variation. So you're not happy with it just moving on a straight line. Okay, it doesn't have to just move on that straight line anymore. Let's do something like, like this, and then maybe offset it still a little bit. We'll do it the opposite direction. 
all right? And then I could go in here and I could take something like, we'll just keep it very basic for now. Let's use the steps since that's kind of been new. And we'll go in here and we'll just like throw on the randomization. I'm actually gonna have this jumping through here and then also impacting the shape. So this is really, really cool. And now with the smoothing control, let's smooth that right out and get a look at that movement. Right, that that's not something you could do before, um, and it's it's a very very cool little feature here. But just get a look at that. All right, <laughs> so crazy. Now, is this something you're really going to be able to use that much? I don't know, but it's worth experimenting with, especially on your your basic things like your filter cutoffs. Um, I've actually been messing around with it so that I can kind of do like a stutter effect, like it kind of comes up, bounces back, and then moves again. Um, that's not something I've really been able to accomplish any other way in the past, unless you could kind of like draw it in yourself. So definitely loving the polynome um, of all of the new modulators that have been added, I think this is the one you're, most people are going to have the most fun with. So you can really think of all three of the new modulators, and we have a sample and hold and a quantize along with the polynome. They're really just modifiers of the shapes of other modulators, if that makes sense. So I'll explain it to you with an example. This is the easiest way to see this. If I bring in an LFO here, right? The LFO is moving smoothly. It's not jumping at different points. What Quantize is gonna do is it's going to start to like step those places out. So right now, if I was to go in and put this on the amplitude, we're moving smoothly. Let's go in here and just like slow this down a little bit. Let's slow it down even more. All right, we're going smoothly back and forth, back and forth. But what if I wanted to kind of jump to different points, to different steps? Can I do that inside of the LFO? Well, we can kind of try to find a different shape in here, but not really. What the quantize is going to allow us to do is something more like the step sequencer in that it will jump. So how do I do that? Well, let's start by going in here and getting rid of both of these things. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this LFO this, this little waveform, and I'm going to send it into the quantize. Okay, and you can see now as it's jumping and going up and down, it's basically following the shape of that LFO, but now it's going at various steps. So if I wanted to now use this on the amplitude, you can see how it's jumping through those different steps like so, and we can go in there further and adjust how many steps here with the quantize that it's doing. It could be very extreme, in this case, just a couple, or we can really smooth it out. And we have different modes here, like this is now very, very smooth, but I can still get it blockier if I bring the quantize down. And this is just gonna be something that you can experiment with on your own. Bring that way down. I feel like I've gone in a little bit too far. There you have something that's a little more linear, stepping through, like so. Okay, so that's pretty much what goes on with the quantize. And the sample and hold isn't a whole lot different to that either. Um, it's just different ways of approaching it. So let's go get rid of the quantize for now. And instead, we're going to send this into the input. Okay, what I like about this one, though, is we have this other timing offset. So we couldn't really adjust the timing inside of the quantize. It was a slave to whatever that modulation source was. But now here, we could go in and you can see that it's now kind of jumping those things based on 16th notes. If we go into eighth notes, you can see how it's now adjusting it by an eighth note. And we can smooth it out also. or go to the other extreme, get 30 second notes jumping through. And then again, we'd actually need to set this up onto something to see it. 
And this is still looking like it's moving relatively smoothly, but it's not. It will be jumping through, and you can listen to it and mess around. And then we have a few different modes here. We have a free, we have a gate, we have a sync. Um, you can experiment with that on your own. Just figured I'd show you generically what's going on with this guy here. Um, both of which are fun. They can offset some things. Don't forget you can even go in and modulate some of these different controls. I could go in and change the timing here, and that's really going to throw things off. <laughs> Let's go to Hertz instead. <laughs> so yeah, so the, these are the sort of shapes, like I've been saying before. Did you ever think you could get kind of a shape like this um, with the basic modulator? Probably not. So that's for me where the sample and hold and quantize are going to come in handy. They're good for additionally offsetting and adjusting the shapes of your traditional classic modulators, things like your LFOs. Um, you could even do it with things like envelopes, uh, the step sequencer, the list goes on and on and on. So since we're already looking at the tool device, you can see that uh, a swap left and right channel has been added. This is really just a mixing utility. It does exactly what it sounds like. It takes the left channel and it puts it onto the right channel, the right channel onto the left channel. So let's say that you had a recording of um, drums. It was a stereo pair and you want to flip around the audience perspective or whatever it is you're doing. You can use the swap left, right so that you can either make it seem like uh, you're listening from on the stage or that you're listening from in the crowd, in the stands somewhere. That's pretty much the point of the swap left and right channels. Just a very basic utility utility, nothing that exciting. But um, if you're a mix engineer, it's useful to have this because right now in Bitwig, you have to do a kind of fairly complex workaround if you want to try to swap the left and the right channels. It is possible, um, but this can now be done with a single click. The last couple of things are more aesthetic and are definitely aimed at people working on touch screens or touch devices. I get the sense that Bitwig wants to really kind of corner that niche market. Again, like I said before, if you can afford a modular synthesizer, uh, you can probably afford Bitwig Studio. And so they're, they're kind of trying to go at that crowd. Same idea, if, like, if touch screens and all of this is the future, they're still pretty expensive, especially ones that are powerful enough to make music with. Um, you can probably afford Bitwig Studio. So you have new display option here, a new preset studio touch display. And then we also have this new virtual like touch keyboard that you can work with and you get some different views and different layouts if you want. You'll see that this does does scale, which is cool. Um, but in terms of actual usage, how much will you use this thing? Ah, that's a great question. I don't really know. If you're teaching music theory and you need to show like steps and half steps, maybe you'll use it. But otherwise, eh, probably not all that much. It's in there. They've got some different modes for you. If you're a touch person, you're definitely going to like this. If you're not, you're probably not going to use it all that much. But it could be cool, especially with the drum pads and things, um, if that's something that you're into. But again, purely aesthetic, not really anything uh, new for those of you who are not working with um, touch input. The last new feature with version 2.2 and something that the Bitwig team has advertised quite a bit is the Ableton Live link support. And as you've noticed, um, a big trend of this version 2.2, I think is really trying to attract a particular clientele. Um, those of you who are going to be working with Ableton Live Link, the way this works is it basically keeps things in time if your devices are hooked up to the same wireless network. So in the past, if you had somebody working on like Ableton Live on a computer, you're working on Bitwig in a computer, you have to do some fairly complex like MIDI um, routing with a lot of wires and even then it doesn't always work. So this is a hassle-free, wire-free solution to getting projects on different computers with different programs to sync up in real time so you can kind of jam together. Now, you're not all working on the same project, right? One person's working in one computer, you're working on another computer, but you can at least sync it up in time and then eventually export and mix 
together. But like I've been saying before, this assumes that you already have multiple DAWs or multiple software programs that kind of need to be synced up together. So one thing that um, could happen, which is common, is let's say you have Tractor for a DJ set and you're using it for more traditional songs, but you also have Bitwig running and you want to do some like live performance on your own. Ha using something like Ableton Link is great for that uh, because you can do those things and it stays in time. And you don't have to worry about things falling out of time. But if you want to record that performance, you would still need an additional like mixing board and you would need to run the, the audio cables into that and then bounce it into a different project, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is not like a collaboration framework in the way that they kind of teased early on um, with their original dreams for the program. Maybe they're still going to go in that direction. I really have no clue. Um, but it, this is not that. Do not get confused and think that suddenly you can be working on a project, you can have a friend in Brazil, and you guys can both kind of get in and start jamming out and, and working on the same project in real time. Uh, that's not possible with Ableton Live link support. Uh, the other thing, though, and again, like I've gone back to before, it seems like Bitwig's um, niche is going to be trying to get people uh, syncing up their hardware and doing it really easily and really intuitively. So if you have like an iPad as a controller, that could actually work really well with Ableton Live Link support. Um, or it's sorry, not a controller, but if you have like a uh, application, like a music application, and you want to jam with both of those at the same time, you can do that with the link support. So if you have like a drum machine or a synthesizer, or even just like a sequencer on the iPad, you could sync it up with Bitwig Studio and be kind of making music from both places at the same time. Um, again, though, you're going to have to bounce out those stems and, and condense it into one project before you can go uh, any further. But yeah, that's pretty much it with version version 2.2. Um, they've added a, d a decent amount of stuff. How much of it's going to be usable for you, I don't know. I couldn't tell you, but that's where we're at with the program light right now. Like always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, requests, feel free to put those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to get back to you. Uh, I apologize for such a long delay here with videos. I had some grandiose plans, but I got really sick, like hospital sick. So it's been a bit of a struggle for me recently. Hopefully though, all that's behind me and I can uh, get back into doing what I love and uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying these videos as well. So thanks a lot for your attention and until next time, take care.